My name is Alden Hutchison, and I'm an associate partner in uh, the IBM Security Intelligence and Operations uh, Consulting Practice. Uh, a, a counterpart of mine, Ahmed, was supposed to be the presenter today. He, unfortunately, was sick and unable to attend, so I'm going to pinch hit and present his slide deck, which, as you guys may uh, know, is, is always uh, fun to do. But uh, I took some of his slides, added some of my own, so I'd at least have some of my own uh, content to, to speak to. Um, but I, I want to talk about the topic of, of incident response preparedness, uh, and I'd like it to be an interactive session, so I'd like you know, the, the audience to also share uh, how you guys are handling this and, and what you're doing to prepare. Um, I don't know all the answers, and I think collectively we, uh, the lessons learned across the, the uh, attendees can be very helpful to everyone. Uh, so I wanted to first start off with a little bit uh, of the uh, data we're seeing from our um, research from our uh, incident response team and, and the types of breaches they're interacting with and, and the types of things that clients are facing uh, as far as uh, breach vectors and the, the kinds of things that, are, that we're seeing coming uh, to the forefront in the future as well. Um, so we derive this data through lots of uh, sources. IBM is a big managed services provider, so we monitor and manage a lot of networks around the world for clients. Um, our own IBM Corporation is one of our clients in IBM Security, and it is one of the largest uh, clients that, that we monitor. So we see a lot of attacks across a lot of the world, and, and so we, we do have a quite a wide data set that we're able to pull this data from. Um, and then also our IRIS team, as, our, as we go out and help clients with their own individual incidents and recover from them, uh, and we perform lessons learned and, and intelligence on how that incident occurred, we're really taking all of that content uh, and pulling it back into our, our research and providing that out to clients so they can learn from those lessons. Uh, and then we also run a lot of honeypots and, and other uh, data sources out there that we can collect information from in order to gather that data uh, and, and be able to analyze it. So, uh, Again, in our research over the last three years, we, we've continued to see you know, financial services and the insurance industry be at the top of the list uh, for the, the most attacked sectors. Um, you know, almost 20% of the attacks that we see are uh, at those targets. Uh, data rich, uh, there's a lot of content there that can be exploited and leveraged either for monetary gain or that intelligence um, to gain more insight uh, around individuals uh, and use that individual uh, data to, to you know, turn it into uh, opportunities to either exploit those individuals further or to, uh, to you know, turn that information into ways that uh, client or, uh, other individuals can you know, gain monetary value from it. So social security numbers, uh, insurance data, performing fraud uh, with that uh, intelligence and that information they're gathering. Um, the second on the list is the transportation industry. So uh, almost 13% of those uh, of that industry uh, is, is the total uh, part of the attacks. Uh, again, you know we're seeing those spread across distribution companies, across uh, airlines, uh, any you know transportation-related industries. Uh, and hackers leveraging that the content that they're gathering um, to, again for other exploits and, and other breaches. The uh, the most common vector to get in is the individual is the the phishing attack. Um, it is continued to grow uh, as a threat vector, and as many tools and technologies as we put in place to protect the infrastructure. The, the human is still the, the weakest link that um, the, and the attackers know that and, and they continue to go after it. Um, we also are continuing to see the target of their webmail accounts versus their corporate accounts being uh, even more uh, of a target. And often uh, individuals, there's less security controls around those webmail accounts. And so it's uh, an even softer target than, than targeting the corporate accounts where you may have phishing tools and other um, technology in place to help protect against those avenues. So, you know, our clients are then trying to determine how much do we allow personal email and, and these web applications to be leveraged in the environment if they are such a uh, target. Uh, and so it's, you know, something to consider as, as you consider your, your acceptable use policy and your security policy whether you think that is um, uh, acceptable and, and, and the risk you're willing to take. 
Um, and I'm just curious, so we can try to get some uh, audience interaction here. Do you, is webmail, Gmail, personal email, something that's acceptable in, in the environments you guys operate in? Is that something that you're allowed to do? Yeah, and I do see uh, to that point, uh, a lot of my clients are shifting to you know, Office 365 and webmail, and even the security controls available in those cloud environments aren't necessarily as robust as what you can de deliver on-prem today. Yeah, yeah. And so it, you know, you're, now you're depending upon some, some web uh, cloud controls that aren't necessarily gonna protect you the same. So it is a, it's interesting from a business perspective to save the money to move to these cloud services, but it's, a, different, definitely a different risk that you're taking on and, and helping uh, the corporation or, or the, the entity understand that is important. You know, what is that acceptable risk and how much are we exposing ourselves uh, to these things? Um, so we saw, again, the number of uh, assets being disclosed, again, a, a bigger increase. There's been some really large breaches that, of course, drive up that number. Um, but the, the total number of records, you know, when uh, attackers are getting in, they are getting a, a large number uh, of, of records and, and able to uh, increase the, uh, the amount of information they're capturing. Um, and some of that is driven also by uh, the number of, of vulnerabilities available to exploit. Um, there is, because of the growth of cloud applications, there's more um, software being leveraged by an enterprise, by an organization, um, and that uh, increases your surface and the, the amount of ways that you can uh, be exploited. So uh, the number of unpatched vulnerabilities uh, has continued to grow. Um, and what we're seeing is clients are struggling to keep up with that. Uh, how do they patch all of these things? If you've got hundreds of thousands of vulnerabilities, how do you prioritize that work? So one of the things we're trying to help clients drive toward is prioritizing those based on how much those uh, vulnerabilities have been weaponized. So we leverage our intelligence research organization to look at what are the bad guys using to attack clients. So this is where our research comes in play. What are those toolkits and what um, what pieces of, of content, what tools are in those toolkits, and then we help drive the client's patching priority based on that. If you um, look at the CVSS score alone, something may be ranked very high on the score, but may be theoretical or may not be weaponized, so, but you may have a low or medium scored uh, vulnerability that is being actively targeted and being leveraged in a lot of toolkits. Those are the things you need. You need that outside intelligence to understand how to drive your your patching program. So I think it's important to consider that as part of your, your vulnerability um, and patch management program and, and really help reduce that surface area as much as possible. Um, another uh, major trend we've continued to see is uh, um, coin jacking or uh, malware being leveraged to specifically do coin mining in clients' environments. Uh, while you know, the individual activity may not be a big threat to you because it could be someone just trying to leverage uh, an asset within your organization for monetary gain. It now opens up a new vector that could be exploited further. So, um, you know, we've seen clients who um, haven't necessarily treated this as serious uh, in the past, but then those, those uh, exploits have been leveraged for later attacks. So, definitely want to make sure that as you see these things that may, may be more of a nuisance to your organization than an actual direct threat, but you, you want to ensure you detect those things quickly, uh, mitigate them quickly so that you can, again, uh, lower that surface area and, and minimize the, the exploitable um, surface. And then one thing we've also seen, uh, oh, sorry, is there a hand up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Bitcoin is an example where, where uh, you know, they've leveraged an asset within your organization to, to, to run their Bitcoin uh, operation from, but now that, that they have access to that asset, they could leverage it for other exploits. So we see clients who haven't necessarily treated that with a lot of sensitivity, and then later on they've been exploited because the... the, the uh, sure. Right. 
Yeah, well, in this case, I'm talking about them actually just uh, planting malware on your system so they can use it to, to run their mining tools. Do you know what the malware is? Is there a malware kit or what? Yeah, there are several. I, I could uh, provide some of that information for you. Um, it, it's definitely something we're seeing more and more uh, active use of as, as uh, people are looking at ways to, to uh, leverage the tools they have to, to make more money. They're, they're trying to attack and, and use these systems. You know, in the past you might uh, see them using these systems to perform DOS attacks against other clients. Now they're trying to leverage it for monetary gain through, you know, through coin mining and other activities. Um, the, the other thing we see with the threat actors is their, their uh, level of sophistication is improving so that they are, once they gain access to a system, whether it's through a phishing attack, through uh, coin mining, they are assessing the environment uh, and understanding how they can exploit the environment based on the, the, the availability that you've created. Whatever network uh, structure you have, the tools you allow to be uh, installed in the system, how much administrative rights you give your individual users. So they're, they're really evaluating the system they've compromised and the systems it's connected to and understanding how they can move laterally uh, in your environment. It's not just, uh, a, you know, trying to exploit with a single toolkit and you know, either they get in or get out, but now that I'm in and I've got access, maybe I sell this access off to another individual so they can exploit uh, the environment. So really understanding um, what they can do within your organization once they uh, have, have breached some asset. Um, and then things that we have started to see emerging uh, um, now that clients are starting to leverage blockchain more uh, in their environments, we are now seeing active uh, uh, evaluation of uh, how those blockchain uh, contracts and that, that chain can be uh, exploited uh, or disrupted. Um, we've seen, um, ag again, more nation state activity around uh, looking for intellectual capital uh, and going after targets to improve um, the uh, intellectual capital within some of those nation states. Um, with the increase of the Mac footprint, which I'm running as well, we now see much more targeted Mac iOS uh, malware. So it's uh, definitely, while it was the small player and not necessarily uh, gone sought after in toolkits and in malware development, uh, is much more uh, a target uh, that we see uh, attackers developing for. Um, and then leveraging uh, much more advanced exploits within toolkits uh, with so many uh, recent breaches of uh, intelligence organizations and now their toolkits have been released into the wild. Um, there's so many more of these toolkits that are leveraging much more advanced uh, capabilities. So uh, it's not just a common malware exploit that's being ran, but, but also uh, much more advanced uh, techniques and, and uh, uh, capabilities within these toolkits. All right, so um, what do you need to do to get prepared? So there's all these threat vectors, right? We've talked about trying to limit your exposure through your vulnerability program. Um, wh when you think about your incident response program, who are the, we always, in consulting, we always talk about them as, as the athletes on our team. So who are the athletes on your team and your IR team? Um, what are their skills? Um, it, it, it isn't just your core IT team, your core security team. Who are the people you're really going to have to involve when a breach occurs? Um, now that it's uh, uh, impacting the business itself, uh, in, impacting the agency, who are the leadership uh, people that you need to involve? Are they prepared? Have they ever given public statements? Have they ever been in front of the press? Um, what, what are their communication skills? What are the inner uh, communication skills uh, uh, among the team? Um, does everyone really have an understanding of, of legal requirements? We often get our IT and security people who understand the day-to-day -day communication and handling, you know, your typical malware, your typical uh, incidents, but are they the ones sh who should be calling the uh, shots on when something's a breach? And how bad is this? Um, do they have uh, the knowledge of, of you know, uh, earlier today, Sean gave an example of he walked into an organization who had declared a breach when it actually wasn't, and then he had a year spent unwinding from that declaration and proving that it actually wasn't. So knowing when to, to call a breach a breach uh, is important, and making sure there's clarity uh, among the team to do that. Um, 
just uh, curious uh, in, in the audience how um, many of you feel like you have a good understanding of who the incident response team is in your organization. Do you, do you have those people identified? Is it, is it pretty clear to you who you would involve in, in those situations? Yeah, yeah. It's it's good that you you've you know established, especially with communications and legal. I, I often see so many clients who the security team and the IT team practice this all the time. They're constantly thinking about because they deal with day to day. You know, maybe it's not an actual breach, but incident activity, and they're constantly communicating about this. But the the business leaders, the people outside of that, don't have that level of. Uh, repeated activity, and so establishing those communication lines early before you have a problem, talking about what the plan is, how would we communicate, who would do that, roles and responsibilities. Uh, so make sure you know your team and, and their skill set from the beginning. And even extending beyond your organization, uh, making contact with local law enforcement, uh, with FBI, having that, that communication prepared. Um, they deal with these activities all the time, and so they can help give you insights into th the things to do, how to prepare to deal with data uh, retention, with forensically sound data management. Um, and so don't just think about what's inside of your organization and inside your control, but how do you extend that out to the other teams that can help you? Uh, a chief risk officer. Yeah, sorry, I, I should have uh, spelled that out. Um, and, and so I, I often find that uh, clients who do have a plan, uh, that they've written a plan, uh, haven't necessarily vetted that with a third party. So it's important either through peer review, uh, through others in your industry, or through bringing in a third party to evaluate your plan and bring those best practices uh, is another big part of that. Uh, it's uh, important that you have a well-structured plan, but you also need to ensure that the plan has all the right uh, levels of communication, um, that it is thinking beyond um, the scenarios where you, you have a, a, a breach and it's just with an IT, but what happens if it's other parts of the business? What happens if there's uh, personal safety involved? Have, have you really uh, written a plan that accounts for uh, all of those scenarios? Uh, because uh, you know, your cyber uh, or your IT capability may run through your infrastructure, through your building infrastructure. Uh, there's so many OT sensors out there now that what may have be a breach of uh, your uh, OT environment now may be uh, becoming a public safety issue, right? So you have to think about your um, communication plan and your IR plan more than in just in IT terms, which if it was written by, many times it's written by security or IT professionals, it's very focused on their world. So you need um, you know, to have people evaluate it to think about the rest of the organization and the rest of the business. Uh, your operational technology, so uh, uh, electronic controls of water, gas, electric, um, building elevators. Um, you know, we'll often see clients who uh, suffer a breach and once they're in your network, they're now controlling your building systems as well or have the ability to control your building systems. Um, you know, the target breach was through the HVAC vendor uh, environment. So not necessarily that it was targeting OT, but your OT environment now exposes you to uh, as much uh, of a threat as your IT environment does. Um, 
of you that, that have IR plans in place, do you have a third party uh, that, that's reviewed them? Have you leveraged maybe a peer review with someone else uh, in a similar industry? Uh, you feel comfortable that they're, it's well vetted? Any? No one's got a plan? It's not well vetted? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, and it's, it's one thing to have it written on paper, but if you're not practicing, if it's not something that's living and breathing, it, it's going to be a problem for you should you have uh, major breach activity because if it's not uh, something that you know by heart, you're not gonna, in the middle of the firefight, pick up the paper and make sure you're going through all those things. So it needs to be something that it comes natural to people, so you need to have it uh, well rehearsed because as soon as that first shot's fired, um, all those pieces of paper go out the door. So that, that exercise process, um, it's good to have tabletops, it's good to have small team tabletops that work into the Indian workflow, um, but how realistic are you making those exercises? Um, are, are you guys able to leverage any um, third party to help drive the realism of simulate an attack in your environment and then uh, don't even inform people that the attack is occurring? Watch their reaction to following that IR plan. Um, have any of you guys leveraged a third party to come in and perform a, like drive your tabletop for you? Yeah, it's not been as realistic, is it? Well, it's complicated. Okay. Um, when you guys uh, think about your plan, do you have things that, again, make it easy for people to follow versus a document like uh, a communications card, something they carry around with them so they know in a cyber breach, in a business incident, who to call, uh, how to contact people. Um, I think that's, again, very important that you think about um, not only the normal business communication, but what are those out-of-band communications? Because your IT system may include your phone system. It may be an IP phone system. So if it's down, how are you contacting people? Do you have a cell phone list? Do you have personal numbers? Uh, do you have personal emails recorded for people? So you have to think about, again, in your plan, those worst case scenarios and ensure people are armed with the information they need. Um, if you lose key people in that uh, IR plan, if the IR plan says the CISO is gonna call um, you know, up the chain of command and they're no, no longer available, uh, if they're part of the disaster they occurred, how do you route around those uh, lo those losses. So, you know, preparing for those scenarios as well. I'm going to miss it on your last slide. Where does your PIO fit? PIO, can you? Public Information Officer. Yeah, it, 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 I refer to it as communications, but you should absolutely have uh, established what that communications plan is going to be as, as part of the IR uh, program. So, who is going to do public communications for you? Uh, pre can some uh, announcements. Um, if you have a statement written and ready, and you maybe need to fill in a few details about when it occurred and what's involved, but the more you can prepare for those scenarios and have that laid out ahead of time, uh, the better off you're going to be. So th that should absolutely be, be part of the, the, uh, the plan. And not, you know, uh, press announcements, uh, potentially going on uh, radio, television to have to speak to reporters. Um, even dealing with reporters as they call in, uh, if reporters find out about a breach, they may start calling randomly into the organization. Do your individuals know what to do? Do they route them to your PIO? Do they answer the, the call themselves? Um, so you, you've got to train even beyond your core staff that's part of the IR program. How do the rest of the organization deal uh, with the situation when um, there's scrutiny uh, involved and when there's outside people looking into this? Um, so uh, we mentioned uh, working with local law enforcement and FBI, so uh, ensuring part of your plan is uh, understanding what to do with the data. Most organizations are primarily focused on how do we recover from this, how do we get uh, back online, get our assets working again. Um, it, it is important that as you do that as much as possible to, to maintain the data that you need to go back and do that forensics, especially if you've got requirements to uh, understand uh, and report on uh, the breach and how bad was it, how many records did they access, if you've got regulatory requirements, you need that data to, to go back and make those assessments. 
So if you, your first instinct is to wipe everything and restore images and, and get back online, um, that's fine and that may be the right call for, for the organization, but know that you, you do need to have some uh, forensics data available if you've got those uh, d additional requirements. So um, knowing who in the organization is going to be responsible for that or potentially leveraging a third party, so having a retainer uh, in place so that you can bring in those experts when you need them uh, is going to be uh, important as well. And then, you know, beyond the tabletops, uh, how much can you simulate live fire? Uh, how, how much can you get a realistic scenario either inside your organization or go to a facility like a cyber range and have that simulated so you can see what happens when um, you know, the, the, uh, the fire, the, the uh, shots start firing. Uh, people will react much differently in that situation when it is as realistic as possible. And they're going to learn from that. You don't, um, you know, no athlete is trained by just watching videos of other athletes. You get out there and do the work and experience the situation. So the more you can give people those opportunities, uh, whether it's you know, that public speaking opportunity, whether it's those leadership skills, um, it's, it's important that you simulate that as, as much as possible. Uh, that's one of the drivers behind why we developed a cyber range for our clients so that we could create those scenarios and give them as much of the effect as possible of if this happens in your organization, what are you going to do? Who are the people that are going to respond? Um, if your communications officer is unavailable, what do you do now? Who's the next person in line that steps in front of the camera? Are they ready for that job? Um, so you, it really allows you to see who's prepared in your organization and who's not. And it gives a lot of visibility into the rest of the organization outside of IT and security of why this is an important function. Um, because how you respond um, is, is as important as the fact that you got breached in the first place in many cases. We've seen so many clients who've um, struggled with how they've communicated their uh, situation and that's caused more of a public impact and more of a loss of confidence in them than the fact that they were breached to begin with. Because I think everyone is in this day and age recognize that breaches will happen, but when an organization can identify it, can communicate clearly what they're doing, can restore confidence that they've got it under control, that's as impactful as, as never being breached uh, to begin with. Um, out of curiosity, have you guys uh, ever been able to participate in any kind of live fire scenario, any kind of cyber range or simulation? Um, have you been able to do that? Not internally, but so I know National Labs puts on fabulous training, it's like two or three days, so you get to do live fire. Idaho National Labs. Idaho National Labs? Yeah. If you get a chance to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, any, any of these facilities you can uh, either you know, the more technical simulations where you put your uh, IT and security teams through it or the more of the business situations where you put your business leaders and, uh, you, you know, the, the people outside of the direct IT organization, the, the, the more you can do that, the better. Um, we don't on time. All right, so I, I've got a, just a, a quick uh, video of the cyber range experience that we developed. Um, I, I've been through it a couple of times with clients, and, and one thing that was most, um, like, that I realized the most is it, it's hardly about the IT experience. It's very much about how does the business communicate and how does the business interact. Uh, and, and that was most impactful to me because in my mind, you know, being in security for the last 20 years, I've always been focused on how does IT deal with the response and recovery, but so much of what happens and so much of the bad things that could happen, happen with how you communicate to the press or what the business leaders decide to do uh, to respond to this. Do we, do we um, you know, just wipe everything and restore? Do we try to uh, mitigate and contain the situation? Uh, are we ready to gather forensics data? And, and many times the business leaders just haven't thought through those scenarios. And so uh, where we've exposed clients to these things, uh, and we do both sort of a standard uh, scenario or help clients customize it uh, to their environment. So uh, can we make it as real as possible using your stock ticker and your information, or is it you know, a, a generic experience? So th those things really make it um, 
ingrained in the, the leaders' heads of, of what they need to go back and do to, to get prepared themselves. Graduate school and business schools all across the country, we have taught people to be slow and deliberate in their decision making, to make decisions with data, build a consensus. These are about the worst things you can possibly do when you're being breached. You need to make decisions quickly and decisively. Hi, hold on one second. Hi, this is Josh over in IT. How you doing? I, I'm doing pretty good, man, except all of our computers have been hit with ransomware. We're probably losing millions of dollars every minute. All right, we're going to work on it from this end. Just keep them off, and I will let you know immediately as soon as we get this resolved, OK? Uh, so yeah, we've been looking at it. I, I have a ping. What happened was, originally, I thought that it would be slowly paced, so we had an opportunity for something to happen, and then we would react, and we would be able to talk about it, and we would be able to gather information and make decisions based on facts. That's how I normally do in my workplace. But in today's exercise, we didn't have the luxury of time. The adrenaline was definitely flowing. What surprised me the most was how well everybody did as a team. We have Matt and HR and hold, and okay. the other he's got all these employees. I think we each learned something, and we were able to gather information. We learned that we really do need to kind of work together. This isn't a one-person job in terms of handling cyber security breaches. It involves multiple leaders within the organization, and we really need to talk to each other and come up with a game plan or act efficiently or have a game plan you know, in place way before any security breach. As we became a team, we could cover each other's weaknesses. It's definitely not just an information technology issue. It's the whole company. So before, my expectation was that a company is breached and everybody's inconvenienced because they can't use their computer and they can't get their job done. And what I'm realizing after the experiment is that it's much more far-reaching, that there's stock prices involved, there's company reputations, there's actual money uh, and financial impact that really could be widespread and global. I think as an IT security professional, uh, this was extremely valuable. Uh, being able to see how it was done uh, and how people reacted, I could not recommend this anymore to anybody else. This is wonderful. I think uh, anybody that has the opportunity to do this, they should absolutely do it. This type of simulation environment is all about building the proactive skills that you need to respond in crisis and be able to do that with confidence. What does a firefighter do all day? They don't put out fires. They practice and rehearse. So when they are presented with that situation, they know how to respond. And that type of muscle memory is what we have to build into our responders. get off this page before something bad plays next. <laughs> um, so th that, that was the, the end of my slides. Any other uh, comments, any lessons learned you, you guys want to share? Any other things that you think are important as far as preparedness goes? How do you determine at what level that you either have an incident or a breach? Because you're going to have to Yeah, one of the things that I think, uh, and, and I learned this through the cyber range experience, is that you, you need a statement on, on, and a forthcoming statement on how you uh, believe the incident, how big it is, uh, how you're handling it. Because if you don't declare that and if you don't communicate that well, the outside entities will do that on your behalf. They'll start to speculate. You know, we believe the incident uh, is affecting this number of users, so it's important that um, if you know you, you want to control the message but you don't want to necessarily spin the message and manipulate the message because eventually the the information could get out and then you're you look worse than you did to begin with if you look at how equifax handled yeah. their communication it, it's only this big oh well now it's actually more now we, we actually don't expose right so you have to really be prepared to to um, control the message and communicate effectively. You know, how much you can spin and um, hide what actually happened is, is pretty risky. Okay, so when you're saying this is an incident, this is a breach. So for the feds, like a thousand email accounts and say, it, it's gonna be very industry specific of what your regulatory requirements, in some industries, they tell you what a breach is. If you disclose X number of records of this type, HIPAA records, uh, personal. Accounts, account compromised, email came in, affected a thousand accounts or something like that. Right. Who would you call that? 
Uh, probably just an incident. I, I don't really think that's a. Nah, really. okay. So, what do you do if you're upright? You know, stuff like that. Well, I think it didn't really exist, you know. And if, if I say it's not, then it's not. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Well, you're going to have to educate them on the potential of that information getting out beyond the, the organization. They can say this never happened, but how many other people were affected? How many other people knew about it and may go talk to their friend who's a reporter or may go put it on Twitter or blog about it? Uh, you have very little control over all of the communication outside of the organization, so uh, you better be prepared to have some statement about what occurred, even if you... If you don't you, declare it, you don't inform anybody, then it's never happened. But if you, end users were impacted, they know it occurred, and if they go uh, Twitter about it, they go post on their Facebook that um, they had some issue with the bank or with their healthcare records, then um, the, the information will get out. There's not any way you can, can stop that. Yeah, but if it hasn't been declared and it hasn't been communicated, then it never happened. <laughs> if that you say serious. so. If you, it, it's, it, that is an, a way to handle it. It's not necessarily the best way, but it is a way. <laughs> uh, any other lessons learned out there? Any, anything else anyone wants to share? All right, well, I appreciate your guys' time. Uh, enjoy the rest of your conference. <laughs>